And will you join us this morning as we all sing together? Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my son. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my son. You are good. You 
search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned
Last thing we need to do is crack our heads open on our second Sunday back, right? <laughs> Take a tumble down the stage. Well, good morning to you again. I already said good morning to some of y'all doing the announcements, and uh, but good morning again and welcome. Uh, we are finishing the Gospel of John today, and I know some. See, Kevin's already bored. He bored by it. He's already gone right there, right there. That's our. So yeah, we'll start off. We'll go back to John. No, no, no. But it's been a rough, right about two years. I haven't counted weeks. About two years in the Gospel of John with some breaks for holidays and things like that, which we don't do a whole lot of at El Paso Bible Church. So we are finishing uh, the Gospel of John today in John chapter 21. So if you would go ahead and open up your Bibles or your phones or your incredibly eidetic memory. If you have the Gospel of John memorized, you don't have to open anything. But I want you to follow along somehow. Ke Kevin's got the eidetic memory down. <laughs> All right, good. Um, but just listen, pay attention if you, don't, if you don't, but it'd be good to have text in front of you one way or another. And you remember we had an image here. We, we had an image. This is a great image, by the way. I, I think this is exactly what Peter looked like in this passage. We're going to get there in a second. But you remember that the very last thing that Jesus did to Peter was hurt his feelings. Jesus, why do you keep asking me that question? It grieved Peter. Lord, you know all things. You know that I really, really like you. You know that I, I, I don't love you like you love me. But you know I love you. Jesus did know that. Who needed to hear that out loud? Peter. Peter needed to hear that out loud. And that was, that's the point of that encounter. Now, yes, there's a restoration taking place. Yes, Peter's resume was restored, in a sense, by that interaction. But the main event there is for Peter to get on the same page, although Jesus already knows, about where Peter is in his love for Jesus Christ. And you'll notice that, that you know, like we say in John chapter 4, you know, Jesus didn't tell the woman at the well to come back when she was ready to commit her life to Jesus. So if you ask me, I'll give you living water. I'll give it to you right now. Bam, drink it once, never drink it again. You'll never be thirsty again for that living water. He doesn't tell Peter here, Peter, come back when you agape me. He doesn't tell Peter, come back when, when your love problem is fixed. We do that in human sitcoms all the time, right? Oh, if we love them, we go, let them go. No. 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 Three times. No. We used to have a joke. When Grace was little, I'm going to tell on Grace. I never tell on Grace. When she was little, very little, we, we knew that the recipe for disaster was the triple no. Grace could handle if I said, Grace, no. She could handle if I said, no, no, Grace. But if I said, no, 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 Grace, that was it. I was in the doghouse for a week with Grace. 
But I mean it. When I say it three times, I mean no. If you love somebody, what Jesus did here, when, as Peter's getting honest with himself about how much he loves Jesus, and it even grieves him, Jesus doesn't say, come back when you've remediated your lack of love for me. He says, here's your job. Here's your function. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, shepherd my sheep. Even in your grief, even in understanding the chasm that exists between how much Jesus loves you and how much you love Jesus. Have you ever been struck by that? I have. I have. He says, here's your job, here's your job, here's your job. Send my sheep. Now you have probably a, a break here, some sort of chapter, uh, section break or something. There's not a break. It's the same conversation, but it's a movement in the conversation. So Peter is grieved. He has an assignment. He, he's gr- <clears throat> I don't know what you expect of Jesus, of the job that he gives you. This isn't glamorous, is it? Y'all remember, like, even if you just came to church on, on Christmas, who's always in the Christmas sermon? The shepherds, right? Every one of you that grew up in a Baptist church has probably played a shepherd or an angel at some point in a Christmas pageant. Everybody. Everybody gets to do that because you don't have to be particularly good at anything to be the shepherd that stands there, right? Only one of the angels gets to talk in the, in, in the pageant. You just stand there. You look cute. That's your job. Being a shepherd wasn't a particularly glamorous thing. And yet that's... That, that's the part Peter, Peter was told. Shepherd these sheep, shepherd these sheep, shepherd these sheep. His expectation was not glamour. His expectation was not glory in that. But he's grieved by this. We, we, we should not take that emotive response out because this is the same conversation. This is the same setting. By the seashore here with 153 sheep, uh, fish, not sheep, <laughs> fish in the net here. Somehow we change topics to sheep. Fisherman Peter, and now we're going to, you're not going to fish anymore. I'm talking about sheep now, Peter. You're going to shepherd now. But they believe, see, you may not have understood, the disciples generally at least had a strong desire, a strong hope, and it was not outside the realm of reality that Jesus would return for them physically in their lifetime. In fact, we see a transition that takes place in the way Paul talks about it in his letters. And that he moves from going, I think there's a good chance, I think there's a good chance, I think, I think that's going to happen, to going, you know what, I'm finishing this race. I'm going to run it with endurance, and I'm not going to see it, Timothy. I'm not going to see it. And Peter, in his grief, <laughs> you know, that's not much of a job, Jesus. <laughs> How long am I going to have to do that? How long? My grandmother believed this. She, she believed that she wasn't going to pass from her physical life until Jesus came back. She believed it sincerely, but it wasn't true. She passed in 2005, I, I think it was. There was a time period where all the funerals I did were for my own family for a number of years, and so they kind of run together a little bit. But Peter would be wondering, well, how, how is this supposed to play out in my life, Jesus? Uh, by the way, being your disciple doesn't seem all that safe. You can call it tending sheep. You can call it feeding sheep. But following after you is kind of dangerous. It's kind of hairy. People do mean things to followers of Jesus. In fact, that's why he had denied Jesus in the first place, Right? Aren't you one of his? No, I don't even know that guy. Don't put his stink on me. I'm not guilty by association. I don't even know that guy. I don't know what you're talking about. You're a crazy woman. It's not common. We know that from history. That it's not common for committed disciples of Jesus Christ to dwell in safety and security. Still isn't. For the most part. glimpses of what that could be like even here. But I don't expect somebody to come in and chop my head off right now. It'll take 16 of them. Because I got 15 rounds without a reload. 
I'm just kidding. Well, I'm not that kidding. Peter's been given a job. People call this his restoration. I think it's, more, it's really more of a, of a reboot. And Peter, this is where your focus should have been, what you were going to do at this point in my life. If you had understood my teaching, if you had understood the, the, the promises that I gave you, and if you had understood uh, the glory that awaits for you in the future, that you were going to rule with me on, on one of 12 thrones over the tribes of Israel in the promised kingdom, in the promised land, if you understood that, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. So let's back it up, and let's talk about what this requires in your life for you to fulfill this purpose in this place at this time right now. And Peter's in a privileged position. Because he's standing eyeball to eyeball with Jesus and he can ask him. You ever wanted to ask Jesus, Jesus, what are you doing? What exactly is my purpose in life? What do you want for me to do? You ever feel like you're kind of poking around a little bit in the dark? No, just me? It's okay. I know y'all are a bunch of liars when it comes to that point. You're not going to tell me. I know that you do not have the script for your life. You know why? Because it'd scare you to death the things that Jesus is going to ask you to do by his spirit in this life. Doesn't mean it changes his purpose or his plan or his provision for it. But you're not ready for that whole story yet. I don't care where you are in your life. But he's in a privileged position. But you might get it. You have friends that ask, answer questions you didn't ask? I know. I, I, they, your face, your, your mouth may not say anything. You may be able to control it, but you can't control your face. Like your good friends know, oh boy. Oh boy, we know what's going through his head. That's a little bit less than what Jesus knows. Jesus knows what is going through Peter's head. And so he answers a question that Peter has not asked out loud. He does this quite a lot, actually, if you pay attention to the, to the way the text is describing what is taking place. He doesn't just do it with Peter. He does it with a lot of people. And he answers questions that they have not verbalized. But he says to Peter in his grief and in his... So, so, we'll just leave it a grief. Truly, truly, I say to you. Now, categorically, this puts this truth at the highest level of all the things. This is a guarantee. This is truly, truly, verily, verily, I say. As the King James would say. It is, it is the truth, highest category. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself. You pulled your own britches up, would be the analog. And you walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will pull your britches up, will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, does that sound like an encouragement to all you folks out there? I've been told so many times at this church, Josh, it stinks to get old. Getting old ain't for sissies, Pastor Josh. I'm like, <laughs> I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. But remember, what, what's the frame of reference? Peter knows that it's dangerous to follow Jesus. Peter knows that it, it, it's, it's, it shortens your lifespan, or potentially does, to follow Jesus. It's dangerous to do the things that Jesus did, to repeat Jesus' words. That's why they were hiding in the, in the room. Remember when Jesus appeared to them? They were hiding out. They were scared to death. Remember? Thomas wasn't. Thomas ain't going to wear no mask. Oh, sorry. Did I say that out? I'm just playing. I'm just playing. He wasn't scared, though, was he? You, you wear a mask if you want. Just don't do it fearfully. Don't fear. But they were scared that their, their lifespan was in for a short, abrupt end following Jesus. More than that, Peter was grieved. I don't know what his expectations were, but he was grieved when he, when he understood and basically had to come clean with himself about what, how much he, really how much he didn't love Jesus in comparison to how much Jesus loved him. John tells us why Jesus tells him this. So you don't have to just not be encouraged by those words because John tells us what Jesus was trying to do. You can be encouraged here. 
Verse 19, now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. This he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. Meaning that that was encouraging to Peter. Because Peter had just denied Jesus, not in recent, in recent past. He had just gone out fishing, wondering if that was going to be his life again. Wondering if Jesus had now put him on a shelf, was not going to use him anymore. Because he was the one that faltered. He gives him the job three times. Tend my lambs, feed my sheep, shepherd my sheep. You love me enough for this, Peter. But all of the disciples are worried that their life is going to come to an abrupt, violent end. Physically speaking. Even at this point. What does Jesus tell them? Your death is going to glorify God. Your death is going to glorify God. Are you encouraged yet? Y- y'all know you're going to die, right? I'm going to die, you're going to die. If the Lord doesn't come back, we're going to die. And I'll take glorifying God with my death whenever it comes. But that doesn't give me a timeline. But notice this. He tells Peter, Peter, you used to do things this way. You used to pull up your own britches and go where you want when you are old. When you are old. You're going to be an old man, Peter. See, because I haven't been sharp enough since 2008 when people tell me, that stinks to get old. Getting old isn't for sissies, Josh. I should have been saying this whole time, it's better than the alternative, isn't it? Right? Not everybody gets the chance to be old. Not everybody gets that privilege or that blessing to see the generations in their family. I know that very personally in the last 12 months. My my father was blessed to have 28 grandchildren, but he died at 63. Not even really, it ain't even going to be retirement age by the time I get there, but he didn't make his own retirement age. But in his death, he glorified God. He did. This is a pretty nice package that Peter is getting here. Peter, you're going to grow old, and your death is going to glorify God. That's a package that's not guaranteed to virtually anybody else that I see in Scripture. So it is encouraging. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. You're going to grow old, and many disciples of Jesus since have not had the opportunity to grow old. Then he says this, and when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. As I read it, as I understand it, and you guys can correct me if you're willing to go back through the entire Gospel of John, word by word, phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, and prove me wrong. But you need that credibility, okay? Because that's what I've done for the last two years. As I read it, that's the first time that Jesus used that phrase the way that we do. What do you mean when you say, I need to follow Jesus? You don't mean what Jesus meant by it. When he told them just a few chapters ago, where I am going, you cannot follow. Meaning, I could give you a map, but you can't walk there. Any other time in Luke 9 that we read beginning of the, at the beginning of the service, you know, that's what he meant. I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, well, follow me. Go ahead. And they all had all sorts of excuses for why they couldn't follow, in, follow him in his footsteps, in the dust behind his sandals, all over the promised land, taking the gospel of the kingdom to the nation of Israel. But here he uses it the way that we do. Follow me. Follow my example. Follow my teaching. Embrace and believe in my promises. And obey. 
follow me. This is a, this is a t- tremendous transition. Follow me. Does that cost something? Ooh. Now you don't know what to answer because you know I get kind of persnickety about people confusing certain dynamics in Scripture. What can it potentially cost you to follow Jesus? Everything. (laughs) The very breath that you are breathing. The life that you believe that it is your right to live in the United States of America in freedom and liberty is given up every day by people who go serve in countries where it is illegal to even speak the name of Jesus. Following Jesus costs you everything. What does going to heaven cost you? You know why? Because that's a gift. We got a problem in America. Is every telemarketer that calls you offers you a free gift. And it isn't free. Jesus wants to give humanity a free gift. And he actually literally paid the price and asked nothing from you. Peter was a justified individual before all of this happened. He was going to heaven when he died. He received the gift. That was his destiny. What was the question? What was he going to do with all the other heartbeats he had left on the earth? What was he going to do with all the breaths that he breathed? And what was he going to do with all the synapses that were firing in his gray matter for the rest of his days? And how was he going to use that to glorify God? How was he going to live his life as a disciple of Jesus Christ? So verse 20, Peter, Peter does this turning around, Jesus turning around. He turned his back on Jesus, by the way, to do this, physically. He just had grief because Jesus was clarifying for him where he stood in relationship to Jesus. He turns his back on. There's a a picture here you're supposed to get, what this requires. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. Skippy, the disciple. Little John, right? See him following behind. The one who had also leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? As, as Pastor Joe saw, he say, John was there so that Jesus could cut his meat for him. John, John was right there in that intimate place where he... He he could get some help from Jesus, and he took advantage of that. And Peter turns his back on Jesus, sees Skippy the Apostle. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? What about this man? What about this man? What do you have to do to have this level of interest in how Jesus is working in someone else's life? You're turning your back on what Jesus is doing in your own, what he's told you to do. Very clear, Jesus did not expand the command. He did not say, all you disciples, you follow me. He said to a singular pronoun, him, to Peter, you follow me. Turn his back on Jesus. How are you going to work in his life? How are you going to, what about him? Doesn't he have to follow you? Do you love him more than me? By the way, that's impossible. (laughs) He said, "I, I agape you, Peter. You're the one with the love deficiency, not me. You have the leaky boat in your love situation. I don't. But immediately when when Jesus says to Peter, you follow me, you do what I've told you to do. You embrace the purpose that I've given you. You do the job that I have given to you. He turns his back on Jesus and says, I need to know the bigger plan. I need to know what you're doing in everybody else's life. 
You ever done that? I know you won't tell me. It's okay. I know we all do that. We all really want to know. We, we would really prefer that Jesus use us in a team effort. We all need to, we do, we need to be together and unified. Scripture is clear about it. We need to be of one mind, of one purpose. We need to put on and put off, as Ernie famously says as he goes through Colossians, all that. He, if you've been in his Sunday school classes over the years, you would recognize that phrase. But the assessment of what we're doing and how well we're doing and what God is doing in our lives through Jesus Christ as we're following him in obedience and commitment and loyalty uh, and pursuing his purpose in our life, the assessment of our product is individual. We stand on our, our feet face to face with Jesus. Peter turns his back and says, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? We had a cute little children's song at Believer's Academy. What is that to you? You follow me, follow me. There's much more to my plan than you can see, you can see. Maybe even you know this. Probably y'all should sing it instead of me. I don't think Jesus said it as a cute little children's song, though. I think he said it more like Pastor Josh says it. What is that to you, buddy? <laughs> Maybe. We, what, inflection is not part of the written record. What is, what is that to you, Peter? You, follow me. Do the job that I've given you to do. Use the gifts that I've given you to do. Use the love that you have for me to do what I've asked you to do. You're going to grow old. You're going to live a long life. Use it the way that I've told you to use it. Well, that clarifies, right? Because I started out saying that the disciples believed, hoped, strongly hoped at the bare minimum that Jesus was going to come back during their lifetime. That they would again see him face to face before their earthly life ended. And here's where I, I get that concern. Because that seems to be what Jesus is answering. It, you're going to die as an old man. You're going to glorify God in your death. You're not going to see me come back, Peter. Not in the flesh, standing on your own two feet. You are going to pass from this life before that happens. And the way Jesus answers that question, what about this guy? Well, what about him? If he doesn't have that same situation... That doesn't change anything I've told you to do. Believers can turn anything into a rumor mill. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Jesus' own words, very clear, he says, it's not your concern. You follow me. You have a promise and a purpose and a job and following me, and I've even given you more information than any of us here have about how your life is going to end. Therefore, though, this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. By the way, I joke about the rumor mill. It did start a rumor. The saying went out that John would not die. There is a very large cultic group, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that believes that John did not die and that he is literally extant walking along the, the, the lands of the earth now. John clarifies that Jesus didn't mean that, by the way. That's a, that's a doctrine that is unbiblical. This saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die, but Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come. What is that to you? John doesn't allow for that silliness. He's saying it's not your business, Peter. I won't tell you how many times in pastoral conversations I have wanted to just say what Jesus said there. What is that to you? <laughs> it's not your business. In fact, I probably have said it. 
Here's the funny thing is that anybody I've said it to is not here anymore. Kind of works that way sometimes. It's not your business what the Lord is doing in their life. It's not your business actually what the Lord is doing in my life. It, if you ask me what do I think Jesus thinks about this or that decision, I'll tell you what I think and what I think will be informed by this book and prayer but I'm not speaking in, in Jesus' place. That's no substitute for you seeking out what the Lord has for you in your life. If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You've got to love Jesus. Love it. That's your business your problem this is the disciple last two verses in this whole book this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true slight shift in the pronouns there we know it, the apostolic cohort. We know this to be true. This is an accounting of eyewitness. It is not just one man's account. It is an approved, verified account by the other eyewitnesses. This is, this is us. And he's testifying to these things and written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things what Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. The world would not be enough to contain the books that would be written. There's not enough shelf space. I, I have friends that have not made the transition to digital books from seminary and they they already can't find enough place for all their books they use their books as furniture they put coffee cups on them they they might put tabletops on them because they 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 haven't they've read the book they've consumed the book but they're not willing to pass the book from their possession and it's it's everywhere until it consumes every little space and what john is saying is that if if everything that jesus did was written in detail that would be your whole world you would not have a place to set your coffee down if all the things that Jesus wrote, did were written down in detail. How long did Jesus do the things that were written down? Roughly. Three years. There's some records of some other things he did, you know, but the primary is the three years, more or less. copious quantities of things. Can you imagine what eternity is going to be like? Can you imagine? Yes. It'll be long, but you say that like it's not a good thing, Tony. It'll be long. It'll be... It, it, we, we might say, see, we have different adjectives for long, don't we? And I, I tell you this, when we're talking about what is eternal life, because Jesus says this. He said, this is eternal life that they may know you. Right? That's what Scripture says. This is eternal life that they would know you. How do you get to know Jesus? That's the very experience of eternal life because we treat eternal life often as if it is merely interminable existence. That has the same technical definition as eternal life in English, doesn't it? Doesn't sound quite so pretty, does it? You, you do not have mere interminable existence to look forward to. You have an eternity to know Jesus Christ. This is eternal life. This is eternal life. To continue to, to grow for eternity in your knowledge of, of who God is, his character, what he has done. Can you imagine the things that Jesus did prior to his incarnation? In eternity past? The things that there are to learn for eternity about him and to know him. John indicates that we're all looking forward to this. 
What's our application? We got a few minutes. Is, is your calendar all messed up? Like your sense of time all messed up? I almost had a heart attack this morning. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I almost had a heart attack because the first time in 20 years I, didn't, I woke up at 7.15 on Sunday morning unprepared. <laughs> that scared me to death. At hours, you know. I don't even know where I am in my sermon. Am I over? We're going to apply this text. We've already done some of it. Follow Jesus. Doesn't that sound like a Sunday school application to you? Follow Jesus. I'm not saying go look for his sandals in the sand, although that makes a pretty cute little poem. Have it hanging up in our house somewhere. Follow Jesus. Follow his example. Love people unconditionally. Tell people about his free gift of eternal life, simply by grace, through faith, and do not commingle that with any other topic in Scripture. And when they have received the gift, then you can tell them about following Jesus. Follow him. Whether you get to do it for a long time or a short time. I may have just a short time left to follow Jesus with my life. I may have just a short time left myself. That's in the genes. <laughs> I'm determined to glorify God whenever that comes. Whether you have a short time or a long time left in your life to glorify him in your death, follow Jesus. Whether anyone does it or not, with you. Whether anyone else does it. Just remember the picture. You've got to turn your back on Jesus <laughs> to pay attention to what he's doing with other people. Keep your eyes on him and follow him. Whether anyone else does it or not, whether your mayor thinks they can shut a church down or not, county judge or whoever, follow Jesus. Make the best decisions you can and glorify him with the life that you have. Whether you can see how God is working in other people's lives or not. I've been teaching God's word somehow or other in some form of pastoral ministry since about 2003. In that time, I ministered in churches. For a, for a long time, I only did funerals and pulpit supply. Funerals and pulpit supply. That's trial by fire. And a lot of the churches that I pulpit supplied in had needed pulpit supply because something had happened to their pastor. And in a number of those cases, that pastor had grown frustrated. Frustrated with who? Why did they become frustrated with the congregation? Because they had been there for 15 years, the pastor. And the congregation looked mostly the same. From year one to year 15. As far as they could see, and that's an important qualifier. That's an important qualifier. Can I see everything? Can you see everything? No. No important that we not get frustrated from our limited view based on what we see God is doing or not doing in someone else's individual's life. Do I sit in my office and I pray, Jesus, what the heck are you doing in so-and-so's life? What's he going to say to me? What's that to you, punk? I hope. I hope we're intimate enough that he can say that to me. You, you follow me. Follow me. And hopefully some of us could say like Paul did. Follow me. As, as we're following. You don't follow people face to face, right? If I'm facing Jesus and you follow me, we're all pursuing Jesus. I keep my eyes on him. You know, there's a temptation as a committed disciple, not just for pastors. I mean, that's just one example. I want you to understand, I'm not frustrated with you, by the way. I should clarify that. That's why I went, I dug deep in the past, right, for me. A long time ago. 
long time ago, and Lord preserve us from me ever having to do that kind of ministry again, because that almost ate my lunch. New church every week, new people every week. People thinking you're a heathen for forgetting the, the invitation at the end of the sermon, that kind of thing. That's crazy, crazy stuff. But as a committed disciple of Jesus Christ, you might have the same temptation. You might say, you know, Scripture tells us to bear one another's burdens, but I feel like I'm bearing everybody's burden. You guys need to get off your butts and get to work. You may never have said butts because you're a real Christian. Have you ever felt like that? I have more than my fair share of burden. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient. Don't pray for a lighter burden. Pray for more grace. It's sufficient. Don't get frustrated with the other disciples around you because you sense that they're less committed than you. It's not your problem. You follow Jesus. You follow Jesus. more extreme end, you might become frustrated with Jesus rather than people. Don't do that either. I don't think I have to go into why. The chasm between the love that Jesus Christ has for his children only, is only one way. He is fully committed. He loves fully, unconditionally, and completely. And we have no right to question how he's working in someone else's life. Simply follow him. I don't know. We're done. We have a song? We do? Okay. There's no rules. We, do, we don't even know what's going on. So let me pray for us, and then we'll have another song. Father, we thank you for this day, and we do thank you that there is...